Uh, thank you very much. Um, I've actually also just published another co-edited book, uh, Crosstalk, Canadian and Global Imaginaries in Dialogue. Uh, I'm thrilled it's just come out with Wilfrid Laurier University Press. So I, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to participate in these discussions and Stefan for starting us off so well. Um, my title is called Taking Responsibility for Humanity's Futures. And I've taken the title from a challenge issued by one of my favorite American poets, Charles Bernstein. He writes, everybody talks about the crisis in the humanities, but nobody takes responsibility for it. In making this claim, Bernstein challenges humanists to take responsibility for our future by engaging seriously with the practice of poetics. He proposes poetics as the foundation for a realm of value that is neither scientistic nor moralistic. Instead, he says, poetics is the ethical engagement with the shifting conditions of everyday life. So what might that ethical engagement mean in practice in this time and place? I think everybody here is asking that question in their own ways and bringing their own answers to our discussions. I don't have any answers for other people, but in today's talk I want to raise some of the strategies I've been employing in uh, working together with colleagues on three interdisciplinary and transnational team projects. These are the Brazil-Canada Knowledge Exchange, Building Transnational Literacies, Building Global Democracy, and Globalization and Autonomy. I'm also part of a fourth team just funded by the Finnish Academy, working on ethical internationalism in higher education in times of global crises. And I'd be happy to talk to you about any of these projects in the uh, conversation series immediately after the talk. So transnational interdisciplinary team research is not for everyone, but it's one direction forward for humanities researchers interested in developing expanded learning communities with new kinds of partnerships and recasting the university as a civic space as a civic space in local, national, and global contexts. One of the advantages of such team research is that it forces attention to how geopolitical and linguistic location influence understanding of what ethical engagement with the shifting conditions of everyday life can mean. Under such conditions, as Walter Mignolo notes, Descartes' claim that I think, therefore I am, becomes dislodged to another formation. I am where I think. Francoise Leonette and Shimei Shi elaborate this rephrasing as recognizing the intimate connection among biography, I am, geography, where, and knowledge, I think. A procedure they see as exposing the pretensions to universality of Western thought and activating in their place a process of epistemic democratization, which is also a movement toward pluriversality. So this double movement challenges ethnocentric assumptions about meaning and how it's made. And these team projects then have alerted me to the continuing necessity of attending to the frameworks within which any plan of action is conceived. We need to find ways to pull together our various projects into connected forms of understanding to mount a purposeful de defense of the value of our work. So we've just heard Stefan Sinclair speak about the digital humanities for a digital society. I think these provide exciting opportunities for continuing traditional projects in new ways and for reconceiving how we work and learn together. Digitization poses new challenges and it offers new opportunities, particularly for transnational, transsectoral partnership work. So in this paper though, I'm going to pursue questions not typically addressed, 
within digital humanities communities. Uh, and here um, I have been influenced by the same Alan Liu article that uh, Stefan referred to earlier, uh, pointing out the need for digital humanities to engage more closely with critical cultural studies. So these are directions described by Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak as learning to think planetarity by developing transnational literacy, by Ngugi Watiango as working through what he calls global ethics, and by Quan Sing Chen in his book, Asia as Method, as requiring a three-part program of de-imperialization, decolonization, and de-cold war. De-cold war is an awkward <laughs> formation, but you get the point. We need to deconstruct these multiple modes of oppressive thinking simultaneously. So these directions are part of what Leonette and she call the creolization of theory. Each of these theorists speaks self-consciously out of the historical and contemporary experiences of different regions within the global imaginary to challenge Anglo-American control and English language dominance of global knowledge production. So each of these theorists can be seen as continuing the project begun by Frantz Fanon and continued by Edward Said, among others, to reinvent the humanities for truly emancipatory purposes. And my Brazilian colleagues warn me to remain wary of that word emancipation. To their ears, it can carry paternalistic and evangelizing Christian overtones. Emancipation as a humanist project can suggest it comes as a gift from teacher to student, but emancipation can never be given from one to another. These theorists change that dynamic. Humanistic forms of non-coercive inquiry can assume liberatory functions when reciprocity becomes part of the process and when talk about knowledge yields to respect for modes of knowing. This value shift remains the uncompleted project of decolonizing initiatives. They've now entered most of the disciplines within the human sciences, but to uneven effect. Decolonization, which should have had a transformative impact, has been sidelined into other agendas. Postcolonial studies have entered the academy, but as an additional topic within an expanded curriculum, where it's been tamed into approaches that often reaffirm rather than challenge imperialistic imperatives. But globalization is bringing the politics of knowledge, always a post-colonial concern, to the forefront of attention in unprecedented ways. Globalization involves a struggle over the control and direction of knowledge production and the knowledge of global affairs. The humanities are part of this larger struggle. And to focus on our challenges alone is, I think, to miss what's at stake in this struggle. I believe it's not only possible to be critical of the humanities in the name of humanism, as Edward Said claims, but also that such critique is necessary. For this reason, much of the writing about the crisis of the humanities today seems inadequate to my ears. Writing about the crisis of the humanities has become a growth industry. Much of this writing is characterized by defensiveness, complaints about neoliberal ideology, or gestures toward minor tinkering with degree programs, while less attention is devoted to how the human sciences can address the challenges facing humanity today, challenges that are bigger than how we organize our educational programs but which will rely on our work for their solutions, if solutions are to be found. Well, you know the range of positions taken in response to this crisis, the conservative return to the classics and the basics shutting down humanities experimentation, the homogenizing claims of world literatures, the liberal defense of how the humanities prepare citizens for democratic participation, the digital advocacy of learning through doing, and the neoliberal insistence on the superiority of vocational training over modes of learning that fail to lead to quantifiable results or to translate immediately 
into gainful employment. Well, each of these responses does contain a grain of truth, yet none of these strategies seem viable, certainly not on their own. Um, what I have to offer in their place is not a full-fledged program, it's more a belief we can do better, and a distrust of the assumptions that govern much of the thinking um, offered by each of these positions today. And finally, a belief that hope can be found in efforts to decolonize and reinvent social imaginaries on more egalitarian principles. So I turn to team research because I think the days of individual public intellectuals bravely speaking truth to power conceived for modernist times are also over in our internet age. Instead, with the World Social Forum and its offspring, the World Forum of Vocational and Technological Education, I see ours as times in which collective advocacy becomes necessary. The World Forum of Vocational and Technological Education modifies the motto of the World Social Forum to cite Leonardo Boss' claim, another world is not possible, it is necessary. So taking responsibility for humanity's futures, as I conceive it, will involve communal involvement in the institutions within which we work and with the partners we can find who share our commitments to inclusive forms of learning that can enlarge the horizons of possibility for all. Robert Young describes the post-colonial agenda in 2012 this way, and I'm quoting him here. Within academia, this task begins with the politics of knowledge, with articulating the unauthorized knowledges and histories of those whose knowledge is not allowed to count. In the world beyond, politics itself often involves a practice of acting in order to make the invisible visible so that its injustices can be redressed." End of quote. So because of the history of the disciplines, the diversity of experiences, and the enormity of the task, I think this project must involve a team effort. Because of the ways in which local issues are always already entangled within global dynamics, transnational engagements are best equipped to address such issues with the nuanced awareness that they demand. So today's talk is part of my ongoing project of figuring out where my research questions fit within the larger theoretical and institutional structures of knowledge production today. And I'm hoping you'll find it resonates with the questions you are bringing to the themes of this conference. My background within literary studies energizes my engagements with post-colonial and globalization studies. Literary and cultural studies shape what I bring to collaborative work with colleagues within interdisciplinary and international collaborative team research. That doesn't mean there is not friction. With Anat Singh, I embrace such friction as enabling the kind of movement the humanities needs to rethink its bases, its frames, and its methods as we seek to understand how our knowledge society is redefining what knowledge is, what it means to know, and what knowing can do. You'll notice I've shifted from knowledge to knowing in that last sentence to register the shifts currently underway from seeing knowledge as something stable to understanding its fluidity and variability at different scales and within different temporal and spatial locations. And I don't see this as a problem. I've lived with rhetoric about the crisis of the humanity since I entered university in 1968. We can't forget our history, but it's time to learn from that history to move forward. Most agree the humanities are experiencing pressure to defend the value of what we do and to restructure how we do it. A consensus has emerged that there are dangers in the corporatization of universities, in the redefinition of students from learners to consumers, the turn to devaluing anything that cannot be replicated or measured, and the redefinition of the goals of university study from the pursuit of truth to the pursuit of profit. 
these pressures are there and they need to be resisted, but our resistance should not be defensive. Yes, neoliberal values are hostile to humanity-based thinking, but they're also part of a larger societal movement that's seeking a renewal of purpose in institutions that have become bogged down in forms of professionalism and elite privilege that are now blocking our ability to direct change in creative ways. Those critiques come from equity-seeking groups that could be allies in reconstructing the humanities. Uh, later this morning, uh, colleagues from the University of Saskatchewan will talk about the indigenous humanities. I'm interested in redirecting post-colonial critique into emerging alliances with such indigenizing initiatives. The idea of students as consumers exists in uneasy tension with the newer model of students as potential material to be trained as what our government calls HQP, highly qualified personnel, and with the older model of students learning to be educated citizens within a particular national community. None of these models adequately capture what our students will need to know to navigate the globally interconnected world now emerging around us and to govern it democratically. We need to think seriously about how to prepare them for a changing job market as well as for the demands of balancing local, national and global citizenship responsibilities in a world where democratic deficits are apparent at all scales. So throughout the 20th century, the humanities have balanced a mission to convey the wisdom of the past alongside an increasing interest in creating new forms of knowledge. The Balancing Act has been construed as opposing our teaching mission against our research mission, and our mission to transmit accumulated knowledge from the past against our mission to create new knowledge in the present. Those distinctions are not helpful, and we need to ask whose interests they serve. In the contemporary university, teaching and research form part of an interactive dynamic. Teaching tests research and generates new research questions. Research compels experimentation with new modes of teaching. For me, both teaching and research have always been devote, devoted to the co-production of knowledge. Uh, and I suspect it's the same for many of you. As digitization changes every aspect of our work, and it becomes clear that our future lies within a knowledge economy, integrating teaching with research becomes an increasingly urgent task at all levels of instruction. David Berry sees transformations enabled by digital technologies as forcing a change in the old distinctions of research as creative and teaching as dissemination. Well, I've never seen teaching in this way. I think that's part of the rhetoric of the new that the digital humanities can sometimes fall into that Stefan was critiquing as well. But what does seem true is that those old distinctions between teaching and research are less and less persuasive today, even as they're morphing into oppositions now being asserted between vocational training and academic training. A new word is entering the research teaching dynamic, and that word is training. Um, this came to me when uh, my department research office advised me to change all the references in my application for my Canada Research Chair renewal, all my references to learning and teaching to training, <laughs> because that's what research is about these days. So this emphasis on training and research funding and government rhetoric is changing how we think about teaching and research in ways that challenge our imagination and our practice as humanists. If the old humanities were dedicated to build on the formation of an individual person and the digital humanities speak more often of community and crowdsourcing, then the research granting councils in Canada speak, as I said, of highly trained personnel. And I think the shift in terminology corresponds to Gert Biest's analysis of how the university's function is changing in global contexts. The university no longer holds a monopoly on research. 
Much research is now conducted outside the university, often but not exclusively in a commercial context. In claiming a right to research, Arjun Apadurai argues that more value should be accorded to research conducted by public interest advocacy groups. These are still just a small part of the general population, but they have important contributions to make. Apadurai is addressing what Bista considers the remaining university-held monopoly, what Bista terms a knowledge monopoly. That is, the right to award degrees, controlling the definition of who counts as a qualified researcher, and the right to control the definition of what counts as scientific. As more private universities turn to the higher education sector in search of profit, it will be important for public universities simultaneously to protect but also extend the integrity of this process. So who counts, what counts, and what about the problematics of counting? I think the turn to developing research collaboratories in the humanities and the structural changes at Canada's Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council to promote partnership development, not just within but beyond the university sector, are encouraging signs that the humanities can rethink our mission and we can collaborate effectively to contribute to 21st century forms of knowledge production and knowing. However, many institutional barriers inhibiting transnational and transdisciplinary research remain. New ones are being erected and the process itself is inherently difficult. The globalization of higher education remains an uneven process that carries serious material effects. These inequities are leading to an increasing impatience with theory and a desire for action, as Stefan indicated. Nonetheless, good intentions can lead to unforeseen effects if careful analysis of prevailing conditions and the larger frameworks within which one is working are ignored. We live at a time of expanding rights discourses. Is it helpful to conceive of education as a human right? And what might such a claim mean in practice? It's easy to endorse the United Nations call of education for all. The hard part is translating such slogans into practice in specific locations while ensuring that the education provided is truly liberatory in its function. I've just come from the World Forum of Professional and Technological Education in Brazil where debates about the appropriate relation between academic and vocational education were intense. How can the needs of multiple stakeholders best be addressed? Young people entering a rapidly changing world, employers seeking trained employees in a rapidly growing economy, and citizens concerned about an unequal society still struggling to democratize after years of dictatorship. I'm still grappling with one question asked at the forum. What will the implications of vocational training be for the marginalized classes? The humanities cannot afford to stand aloof from such questions, nor from our society's needs for technical expertise. The old hierarchies that put a higher value on elite professional training than on technical training are breaking down. But the social and political effect of these changes and their impact on the quality of individual lives and their societies are hard to predict. The concern with impact is not just a neoliberal fetish. Those seeking a more equitable society also care about the impact of our research and our educational decisions. Those of us in the humanities need to work with our colleagues in other disciplines to better understand the value and the limitations of what is meant by the turn to evidence-based research and standardized forms of measuring research productivity so we can better assess what their implications might be for the effectiveness of the learning cultures we seek to promote. The trend today is to draw humanities into forms of assessment designed for the sciences and medical professions. We're still slow in understanding the implications of these shifts and articulating our necessary difference from them. If we return to Bernstein's suggestion 
of learning to think about approaches that are neither scientific nor moralistic. So then I'm arguing we need to think seriously about, about what both of these approaches involve at the same time as we articulate what ethical engagement with the shifting conditions of everyday life will mean in our local, globally entangled condition. So I think this kind of thinking can best be accomplished through collaborative engagement, which acknowledges the pluriversality of human ways of knowing. We need to know how humanity's research is implicated within cultural, social, and political life in many different parts around the globe if we're to understand the particular challenges of our own time and place. The English language has afforded many privileges to Anglophone researchers in Canada and the United States and Australia. But those advantages also come at the cost of isolating us from the work being undertaken in many other parts of the globe, especially in the human sciences, where the role of English is still not absolute, as it is becoming uh, in the sciences. Apadurai is thinking of us when he writes about the need to deparochialize the research imagination. A task, I suggest, can be begun through transnational and interdisciplinary team research. The institutional frameworks within which higher education operates are linked to decisions about its purpose, curriculum, pedagogy, and conduct of research. If humanists are to address the push and pull of globalizing pressures, we need to move beyond the theoretical frameworks that currently direct our vision. Interaction with researchers from other constituencies, disciplines, cultures, languages, and geopolitical locations can help us achieve the necessary distance to make sense of our own experiences and locations. And at the same time, we can bring the de-imperializing, decolonizing, and de-cold war perspectives that Chen advocates to frameworks that are still largely impervious to such critiques. Well, Spivak's embrace of planetarity marks her attempt to get beyond theories that distinguish between static, traditional societies where norms are assumed to be incapable of change, on the one hand, and self-identified modern societies where self-questioning enables change on the other. Indigenous and post-colonial work refuses that tradition modernity distinction and the assumptions on which it's based. Spivak moves away from this tradition versus modernity optic in suggesting that her idea of planetarity is perhaps best imagined from the pre-capitalist cultures of the planet. She sees in these pre-capitalist imaginaries an alternative to the need for self-consolidating others that characterizes European modernity and that Robert Young finds inhibits much post-colonial thinking as well. We have to start talking about the capital O other. The challenge posed by these alternative imaginaries constitutes part of Spivak's project of training the imagination to be tough enough to test its limits, unlearning our privilege as our loss, and learning to learn from below. These catchphrases set an agenda for developing reciprocal modes of knowledge production with the potential to take us wherever we're situated within global power structures past some of the impasses we're experiencing today. So, in conclusion, if we're to move beyond the lingering legacies of imperial, colonial, and Cold War imaginaries and the diverse forms they continue to take in different parts of the world, then we need collaborative forms of interaction that can take us beyond what any single individual or single location can provide. We need the kind of interregional, interdisciplinary, intergenerational, and collaborative dialogue that team-based research can provide. These conversations will be disturbing, surprising, and revelatory. In my experience, many of them center around the contradictory associations of key words in different contexts, leading to vastly opposed sets of values attached to particular highly loaded terms, 
terms such as emancipation, materialism, mentor, and democracy. Working to set the conditions in which such disputes can be aired and worked through takes time and trust, but it will be necessary if new kinds of connections can be drawn to create mutually agreed upon forms of understanding. So as we move out of this morning session into the garden dialogues, I'm really hoping we can start some of those conversations now. So please don't just disappear. Uh, go out if you wish to get a coffee, but bring them back in because I think Stefan and I will be here and we both want to listen to you and we certainly both have a lot more that we would like to unpack from our presentations.